What is up, guys? Episode number two. Yeah. We got Devastating DC. We got Eric Catalano. We got Nathan Mall. Uh, Daryl Cobb is a professional athlete. He has been fighting for, shoot, uh, about 14, 14, yeah, 15 I was gonna years. Say 13, 14, 15 years yeah. now. Yeah. Eric is a devastate devastating Eric devastating that's right. Eric. That's right. yeah I was thinking about this today I was like man you got like devastating DC that's like awesome you probably got like crazy biker nicknames and right. stuff right. and then like what's your stage I go by devastating Nathan that's so crazy you yeah. guys got that in that's common. so weird yeah, it's, that's I, so it's, it was on my birth certificate man, it's just a coincidence that, that, is, a, that, that is a crazy way. thing yeah, it's weird it's, it's such weird. an odd thing that's so crazy. So I'm also time. a professional athlete um, for 14 years. And I also know Darius Miles. Yeah. There you and go. He knows Darius Miles. Yeah. So we have got some cool stuff to go over right. today. The first thing um, the first thing I wanted to talk about, so this is a really cool thing, and this is uh, uh, just something you've been doing for a while now. So Eric is a tattoo artist. And uh, one of the things that he does that he specializes in, he specializes in 3D body tattoos, oh, right? Dope. That's dope. So there have been a large number of people, women, uh, that have had breast cancer uh, surgery, have had mastectomies, and um, they had, you know, their nipples are removed, basically, and they feel different, you know, because, they're, they're, you know, there's, uh, there's a difference there. Right. And so what you've done, which is insane, um, is you've, you've tattooed 3D nipples onto the breasts. Right. Um, which is, dope. you know, Thanks. so like... That's dope. Which Good. is a wild thing. And then the new thing that you did that I thought was really cool that when I saw the picture, I didn't, I wasn't even, I wasn't sure what, I, you know, because I wasn't sure what I was looking at. So there's a guy who got about what? The first two knuckle or the first knuckle, down to the first knuckle cut off. So he's got the bottom of his finger, you know, his, his like uh, fingernails are gone. And you mm. tattooed a 3D fingernail Damn. onto the finger. Holy Correct. shit. So it looks... Uh, well, I'll post up a picture so you can see it. It looks just like uh, it's an actual fingernail, yeah, at least does. from the picture I saw. You know, I'm sure if you yeah. get it at an angle, it's a little bit different, but it's really remarkable and awesome work, by the way. Thank you. Oh, man. Man, that's cool, man. Yeah. You're like cool. a 3D printer. Yeah, yeah. pretty much. You're like yeah. a 3D printer. 3D art tattooer. printer. That is super yeah. cool, man. That's like, great. Real. I'm like, kind of like God, but afterward. You know what I'm right. saying? Yeah. Right. With eight, like day I'm 14. Right. You're like, right. I don't like day, day 14. 14. Right. Yeah, it's like, all right. right. And then there, there be 3D tattoos. Yeah, at that point, you yeah. don't even, He takes a nap. He doesn't even give it. And then he take it away. <laughs> and then I give it back. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> So. so you've got you've got a lot of uh, publicity about that. You actually had to draw a uh, limit on the number that you can see because you've been so overwhelmed with people at requesting those tattoos. Oh that yeah, you've actually crazy. you know you haven't been able to get actual work done, so you've had to put a cap on it. That's true. That's awesome. it's been crazy. It went viral, um, millions, millions nice. of views, and and uh, I've just been inundated with requests for the for the services. That's awesome. It's been crazy. So has. Um, you you were already a real well known tattoo artist, right? So you're one of the top, in my opinion, at least. I maybe it's just my circle of friends, but from my circle, without a doubt, I would have to say that you and I've got a pretty big circle. Your your name comes up when people suggest, you know, people are like, hey, where do I go to get a tattoo? Your name always comes up at the top of the list as far as number yeah. of people that recommend going, uh, how adamant they are. You're always at the top. So before you already had a successful tattoo business. Now that you've had these this crazy viral stuff, has it changed a lot? Has it increased? Has or is it just the same? It's it's been very hard to manage. Yeah. Mm. Um, mm. You're right. I mean, I was I was overrun before any of this happened. With sure. Fingernails. The nipples is something I've always done. It's just I I kept it kind of quiet. You right. Know? Like, well, I wouldn't say kept I kept it, it quiet, kind of quiet, like, like to your kind of like my Facebook knew about it, it you right. know, and and stuff like that. But even that was manageable, you right. know, like even then it was just five or ten ladies a month. OK. You know, after how this. Long that, what's that come out to time wise? You know, it's like maybe 20, 30 minutes per purpose. Oh, so you're talking so, like. No, it's not bad. And yeah, so, so I do talking, those for free. So I do those free of charge. Because that's it's awesome. my way of giving back to the world or to the to the humanity or whatever. Yeah, that's great. And it never took me a lot of time, you know? So I was like, I'm happy to do it. Right. You know? An hour, a week, you know? Yeah. No big deal. But now it's like, there's no way. And the yeah. one, whenever you started doing that, what uh, what was it that got, like, did someone just come in and request that? Yeah, I was doing a bunch of, you know, since 2010, we've been doing breast cancer awareness tattoos, like little pink ribbons. Okay. For free. Oh, wow. 
you know, just one week a month, first week of October every year, you yeah. know, give them away for free. People tipped. So my artist still made a little, little pocket money. Sure. It was a good cause, whatever. We did it one week a year. No big deal. And we do thousands. Of them, you know yeah. what I'm saying? It was, it got pretty crazy there. But through that, you network with so many survivors, so many afflicted people of breast cancer, you know, that you end up meeting a lot of people in the breast cancer circuit, you know? Right. Then these people start asking about the nipple stuff. And so I started kind of researching how to make it look realistic and blah, blah, blah. Kind of one thing led to another. That's awesome. So it is. It's just perfection kinda, of craft. Yeah, perfection of craft. Yeah. I like it. Well, you're not only perfection of craft, you're perfecting being. Right. You know what I'm saying? And, and that's, that's what's important because if you can give a person confidence from their, their, their defects, that's awesome. Oh, you know what I'm saying? You awesome. go get blessed for that, man. Yeah. That's why you can't manage your shit. That's right. You that's right. <laughs> that's your blessing. I've been you know? overly blessed, yeah. <laughs> uh, can so, I say shit on here? Yeah, you say whatever you want. Okay, shit. But I've been blessed in reverse, man. Like, I don't know. I guess I got major karma points because great things have been happening to me and, and things have just been real great. I've had a lot of people step up and offer to help me with my scheduling. and That's awesome. You know, so I've had people going through all those. I got hundreds, maybe thousands of emails from yeah. all across the world. You wow. like I could have never replied wow. to all of them. You're at a spot now, like, through if you set things up right, you'll really um, be able to establish not just a business, which you already have, but... I feel like you'll be able to start, establish like a massive following, which is something a lot of people aspire to get to. You know? Yeah, yeah. Um, and if you just do it, I mean, it's you're just right there, you know, yeah. right on the edge. Yeah, it's awesome, and it's all and it comes from perfection of craft, which is you know, one of the things that I I feel like, which is something everybody has in common, you know, because everybody that I bring out, they're always somebody that is um, they're a specialist in their own right, whatever that area might be. But one thing like across the board, whether it's a fighter or if it's, uh, you know, if it's a tattoo artist or an artist or a, or a comedian or whatever it is, everybody, I feel like they tend to have the same thing in the sense that it's they it's uh, the mentality is very similar. Hmm. Like being able to just dig through the trenches and go through the tough grunt work and push yourself to the next level. And then, um, you know, whatever your goal is, I mean, that's, you know, it's something I feel like everybody has in common, you know? And like you've had, you, I know, you, when you started out fighting, because I don't think I met you, I met you close <coughs> to the beginning, but not at the very beginning. Right, right, right. So when you started, where were you coming in from it going into your fighting career? Oh, man, it's crazy. We was just talking about that. Yeah. Um, I, I was always a fighter. You know, I was forced to fight when I was in, like, a fourth grade. You know what I mean? So that kind of changed my perception of how I looked at things because I got bullied. You know, right. I, I had to fight five or six people. So yeah. I always wanted to learn a martial art. And I was telling him a story um, where... It was a guy, I went, it was South St. Louis or whatever, and he was an instructor. And you know, he came, I came in, I said, I want to learn more shorts. And this guy, scared of me, you know, told, you're a big guy. He's shaking, holding a quarter-inch board. Yeah. And say, hit this, not bow. He was like, see what I'm saying? Look at the confidence. I'm like, you on some bullshit, man. I got to get the hell up out of here. Right. So I end up going to a gym in Pontoon Beach, and I seen my master chief, Jermaine Andre. Right. He was, he had his crew, Ryan, Ron Smith. And what gym, what gym was that? That was on Family Fitness. Oh, yeah, yeah. Family so Fitness. Did you go? You were just working out there? Like, yes. Lifting? You were yes. just lifting there? I was just lifting there. So, and I seen, I seen the little sign-up sheet, and I was like, that's what I want to be with. Okay. And strangely, a friend of mine, my, like my brothers, they right. were starting this record label, and he was the security guard. Oh, awesome. So, seen him, met him, and I started training, and from that point, 2004, 2005, I was a professional fighter. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. That's and from from three fights, four fights down, I was on TV. Yeah. That's awesome. You know, four fights later, I'm on a reality show. Oh, that's you know? awesome. So, yeah, yeah. That, that's kind of how it turned out. Man. Yeah, I've been following Jermaine on, on Facebook, and I've, I've met him many times. Um, and that's, that he's the real deal, man. Oh, yeah. yeah. That dude is oh, the man. real deal. I respect him a lot. Yeah. Right on, man. Right yeah. on. So when you were going through like all this transition, you just felt natural flow. Like it wasn't, uh, you didn't have like a big grinding point. Cause I feel like at everybody's at every, at like everybody that gets into the fight game at some point in time, they had to grind. And so do you feel like the grind happened way before you got into martial arts just from getting bullied and yeah. Yeah. But it's interesting because the, the martial arts aspect of it was before cause I had to fight, but the actual, the sport of it, right. my grind was, 
four fights after I started. Sure. You know, when I got into actually fighting on Bellator and on a reality show, that's when the grind got tougher. Because now it's real. Yeah. You no, know, and I have like I was a single parent. You know what I'm saying? I, I had a full time job. Right. These guys doing that full time, so I'm fighting these right full time fighters, yeah. and that was where the grind came from. That's oh, where yeah. I learned a lot of my shit that I, yeah. you know, that, that I had made mistakes on from these professional guys that do this every day. So the grind was actually four fights after as far as the sports aspect did you yeah. feel like that actually worked out to an advantage because like your body was almost more rested yes like, they talk about that a lot like i know like like i'm a big i mentioned that to you earlier i'm a big basketball fan right a lot of times they say like when a basketball player hurts like their like wrist or something like that they're like well at least they'll have fresh legs when they come back right right you know right what I mean? right so right. it's like it actually can almost work to a benefit and it does it can. yeah it, it's amazing because with me for the whole 14 years, I was trying to find out who I was as a fighter. Right. You know, I knew I knew who I was as a martial artist. I'm just speaking as a fighter. And that's three years ago, I honestly put it all together, you know. Yeah. But this is towards the end where I'm doing more training than fighting, you know. Yeah. And, but it's, it's crazy because... So you feel like you're better now? I'm a lot better now. Yeah, I'm I feel the same. I'm a hell of a lot better. I'm um, a hell of a lot better. Yeah, I, I heard something interesting today. It said, this guy said, he's like, man, you don't actually hit your peak until 46. Like, 46 is the time when you're like, if you've been steady training and treating your body right, that, you, you know, your cardio, you can be a top-level cardio, top-level lifting. He's like, 46 is the magic age where you're just the supreme athlete. Wow. I mean, I totally agree with that, wow. though. I totally agree, because it's crazy. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm 38. I'd be 39 this year. Right. And I'm in better shape with less training than I was when I was fighting regularly. And it's crazy. Well, I think part of that too, though, is that you've been, it's, all right. <clears throat> think about, think about this. Think about a time when you were just grinding through training, like just grinding through hard ass training, right. right? Grinding through really hard and you, you start to wear down. You yeah. know, let's say you've been doing it three, four, five months on like just nonstop hammering your body and, and training hard, lifting hard. Uh, plyos, all that stuff, doing everything you're supposed to be doing, but doing it to a maximum level. And let's say five, six months in, you start to feel pretty beat up. Yep. You know? And so I feel like what happens later on is because you're not grinding so hard, like you were saying, you just naturally, you naturally tend to put less overwork in. Right. Because I don't feel, I don't really actually believe in overwork. Well, I, I guess I do, but it's more of a relative thing. So it's not its not like, oh, this is overworked. There's like a set amount. It's more of a question of you personally. Yeah. You yeah. know? Yeah. So there's not there's never like a magical number. It's always relative to the person and relative to what their training uh, level is. Right. And right, for right. some people training two or three times a week, that is the maximum that they would be able to do depending on what their training load is and all that. But so I feel like now, you know, later on in life, you're you're still in this this training period, right. but you're not grinding the way you were before. But you still have the muscle memory, and you've been doing it. Think about the number of hours you've just been doing it for a longer period of time. So you've got like better neural connections, and you've got better muscle activation, like all that all that weird stuff that you probably don't think about. But you still train. I guarantee you, you train like what three times a week at yeah. least. Yeah, just actual training, and then maybe you do some other stuff outside of right. that. Yeah, right, there's right. This, uh, there's this great book called Grit. Um, Written by this amazing, she's a professor. Her name's Angela Duckworth. Okay, and um, I'm about to check that out, man. Yeah, it's, it's really good. But she talks about like one of the major things that like sets people apart. A is work ethic, uh, but also finding this thing called flow. And we all know what flow is, just right? Inherently, but like she's actually like researched, studied it. Yeah. Uh, and she's a like I said, she's like a professor, and this is what she's dedicated her life to is the idea of you like working hard through the difficulty, like. There's always like the beginning of the story where everything is sexy and fresh and there's the end where everything is like sentimental and and nostalgic but it's that middle where it's just really ugly and dirty and unsexy and unclean. Yes, yes, yes. And she said when you can train during that time oh, and yeah. actually like find the value of training during that time. Not oh, even yeah. loving it. You don't even have to fall in love with it. Just she, make yourself she, do it. She interviews like an Olympic swimmer that says like are you asking me if I really love waking up at three in the morning and swimming several hours 
and staring at nothing but the bottom of a pool. Are you really asking yeah, me if I love that? that's crazy. That? No, I do not love that, but I love swimming. Right, right, right. Right, so it's like, so it's finding the big picture, why am I doing this? What is the value of why I'm doing this and why am I striving toward that? Yeah. You know what I mean? And I feel like that's probably a little bit of what it is. Like yeah. the grit, like. Being able to tough through it. And, yeah, and the belly that, of the whale. That kind of reminds me that, of what you know? I showed you earlier. Where it was, I, I got this eight year old that I teach. Yeah. yeah. And he was kind of lethargic and he was uh, yawning. His, uh, and he throwing his combinations out. I'm like, hold up. Hold up. You tired? This is when you're supposed to do it correctly. Right. Because you develop these bad habits in your subconscious. And when you're not tired and you're feeling good, now you're dropping your hands and now oh, you're yeah. doing it wrong. Yeah. So that kind of reminds me of that it's through the hard time is when you really oh, need yeah. to grind it out. Yeah. Because that's when you develop in your subconscious. So, yeah, yeah that, that's interesting, man. That's good to remember. Like, he and I were talking a little bit uh, before, you know, but we were talking about, like, similar to, like, baseball. You know what I mean? Like, if you play baseball and you, you get tired and you start slumping your shoulder, it's going to affect your swing. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, yeah. and, and you continue about. to do that, then when it's important, guess what? You slumped your shoulder and yeah. now, oh, yeah. you oh. know, you you the cause of the game possibly being lost or whatever. You know? Oh yeah. Or if you do it correctly, you could be the cause of the winning winning you know hit right. or run. Right. You know, right. it just depends on how you how you're acting and yeah. what you're doing when you're training when you don't want to do it. Sure. And that's important. What did Mike Tyson say? You no. Know, what was the saying? Um, I think he said, "I'll eat his children." <laughs> <laughs> Get what the fuck he said, man. <laughs> but it's like you 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 train best when you don't love want to do it or something like yeah. that. Uh, I forget the saying, man. But we'll I find it. it. We'll look it. Up. Look it up. Look it up. Pull it up. Yeah. He's got a man. He's got a lot of good stuff. And you know, with Kristen Mono training him, I feel like um he there's so much knowledge there that I was looking into the last couple of years just from great quotes from Kustamano yeah. about training and mentality and how you need to like focus I mean there's so much so much in there and it's like you never get um you don't really hear as much about Mike Tyson as a philosopher, you right, know? Right. You always hear of him as this savage animal just murdering people and destroying them. But there was a lot of philosophy going into that. And oh, it's yeah. like a warrior philosophy. You know, I heard someone call it brainwashing, but I don't feel like, I don't know, I don't feel like that's brainwashing to encourage someone to be excellent at whatever it is they do. Right. You know? That kind of reminds me of your boy Michael Jackson. Oh, you know? yeah? Yeah. Well, that's like, that? Yeah, because... A lot of people don't understand. He was a celebrity, a superstar at like age ten. Right. So he never had a regular life. He right? was Bieber before Bieber. Right. And he was Bieber before Bieber up until adult. So he's always and he never had this regular life, man. Right. And, and it was yeah. one of them things where he wanted to be normal, and he couldn't be normal, right. you know, at all. Right. At all. And it was all, and that's where all the confusion comes from, and people don't understand that. Now, and, and, and I know that um, it's kind of off subject, but it's on subject on what we're talking about. Yeah. You know, when, it's like when people in a certain position in their life, especially growing up in that position, it's like if they don't have a normal life, you can't be normal, and it makes them weird, and now people pick on them and, and you know what I'm saying, say things about them. And, right. But yet they want to be around them. Yeah. yeah. What's up with that? I think this. Yes, that's it. Discipline, doing what, what you hate to do, but you, um, do, it like you, but you it. do it like you love it. That's it. Discipline, say it again. Discipline is doing what you, what you hate, hate to do, to but do, doing but it like, doing you, like love you love it. it. Mm. Yeah. I'm going to have to use it on my That's case. it. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's an important thing. He's got other good ones. That are better than but that. that. But that's that's basically what, what it is. Like, when you don't want to do it, you know, and you hate doing it. Sure. But you love doing it, so you make yourself do it. And that's how you become a Michael Jackson. That's how you become a Mike Tyson. That's how you right. become a Michael Jordan. Sure. You know? I got to read this quote just while we're here because it's so funny. But it says, everybody thinks this is a tough man sport. It's not a tough man sport. This is a thinking man sport. A tough man is going to get hurt real bad that's in this it. sport. Oh, yeah. Mm. Yeah, it's a, it's a smart game. I mean, talk about the boxing thing. Yeah. 
You, if you're not if you're not clever, if you're not if you're not quick, if you're not devastating, right, you will get worked. And if you're not fast, you're not quick on your. You know, there's a lot of boxing analogies that just are they're analogies for life. Like yeah, if you're not like quick on your feet at this point, you know. Yeah. There's so many different boxing analogies that are uh, they're just excellent examples of mentality for life. And you're right. If you're just a tough guy and you think you're going to step in and box, you're going to get worked. You toe right? up. You're going to get worked. And people will they will break you down. They call it a sweet science for a reason. You yes. know? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I think. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Cool. So, so back to Michael Jackson. Back to Michael Jackson. So you think. Hot topic. All right. You yeah, think very hot that. Topic. Um, you think that? Do you think he did it? That he molested kids? I, I don't think he did. did so man. why not? Reason being, um, with, with my opinion, yeah, I, I think he just wanted to be a normal kid, right? And he wanted like the whole. Okay, let's go to the Neverland okay. ordeal. Okay, you got to think about it. In order for Michael Jackson to go to outside, he fucking had to wear a costume. Okay. He had to wear a costume, so he couldn't go to a amusement park. Okay. All right? So what did he do? He built one at his house. Right. Right? Right. Him being the one at his house, and now he said, okay, I got this big-ass amusement park, and I don't have nobody to fucking play with. Right. Ain't no grown man finna be riding on no goddamn roller coasters. That ain't, that, that, right. you know, like, okay, Eddie Griffin was like, all right, man, I'm coming, kick it with you, but I'm not finna be riding on no fucking roller coasters and sitting on elephants and shit, man. Right. So what that attracts, kid. Right. And he was a fucking big ass kid. He never grew up. Okay. So I don't even think molestation and trying to fill on these kids was even on his mind. Okay. But he was a very easy target because he was a weirdo. Yeah, you know, yeah. And the reason why he was weird, because he never grew up. Yeah. Um, he never yeah. grew up. So, yeah, here's my thought is this. Um, you know, and this is something, and it's it's really relevant right now with the whole Me Too thing and all of this. Uh, and, you know, there's a lot of guys out there that are famous that are, they're like accused rapists. They're accused child molesters. They're, there's a lot of d interesting stuff that's going on right now. Oh, man. But <laughs> here's, the, here's the thing. If one person comes forward and they say, hey, this guy's a rapist, this guy's a molester, whatever. <laughs> That's one thing. If like four different people, and I don't mean like four people in the same crew all come together and say that. I mean like four separate random people all come together separately. And it's not just four. I'm just throwing out a random number because I think it's a lot. There's a, there were a lot more accusations than that. So it's not just that there were four. It was like a lot of accusations over the years. So it's like when there's one, that's, that's questionable. When there's two, it definitely raises an eyebrow. But when there's three and three from all separate, um, separate like groups, they're not, it's not like three friends coming together, three separate random people coming together with the same story. Do you realize how that would definitely make me think or a mass majority of people think that something definitely oh, happened? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, and so with the number of allegations, which there's absolutely more than three, right? Do you does that influence your opinion at all? No. So what? All right. So how about this? What if I told you that he had a lock pad on his bedroom door? He had sensors in his hallway leading to his bedroom door that anytime someone's walking through, that it would like ring a chime in his bedroom. Mm -hmm. And what if I told you that he had another? off his bedroom he had a child size room that was only tall enough for like a child to go into so it's like this own little child cave inside of his own bedroom right are plus you, the were you number there? of allegations that's exactly what I was not, what I'm you, say. are you sure that's exactly oh, what I just don't want to get into some traumatic well memories for you okay, got you. Right. so it's not like this is all court stuff this is just stuff that's been in trials this okay. isn't like my personal speculation like me no, coming out no I just out. was asking oh, yeah, yeah. if you were actually that, 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 there that, that, oh, hell no that, that's, but that's, with that kind of information you know what I'm saying yeah yeah and so the news has covered it in detail and I get like the news isn't always a dead point but this is something that has been widely covered in not just court documents and news coverage it's been widely documented. Okay, let me stop you. Yes. Why? You say it's more than one, right? Yes. What the fuck are these parents letting, this, letting these kids, knowing this shit, right. go Agreed. and stay with this man? I 100% agree. Why? Yeah. All right, so then here's my next question for you. Let's go. Would you let your kids stay at fuck my Fuck no. There you go. 
Fuck no. So even though you support but, him, but, and here's what I like about you, and but, here's but why. The, I'm, but the yeah. thing is, it's not because of allegations. It's because I don't want him, my kids, stand with no fucking Michael Jackson. Right. I don't anyone. know Michael Jackson like that. I don't know fuck how famous he is. Nowhere, right? nowhere else. I'm not gonna do that. I brought it to let him stay with you. Right. right. So it's not because it's Michael Jackson and, and all that shit. Someone you don't know. It's just somebody I don't know. Now, it's, what, it's if cool. it's, what if it's Michael Jackson and you kind of know him and he's got allegations? Or what if it's Michael Jackson and you really know him and he's got allegations? I'm, then what? I'm still not going to do it. It's still not going to let the kids I'm, hang out. I'm not going to. Uh, just unless, because you know there's a risk. No, nah, that's because... I'm not gonna let my kids stay over there at anybody's house. Just like, okay, okay. Now I'm over there, and this is this is the type of relationship that we have. Oh, I'll come over here. Yeah, let's spend the night. Then that's fine. Right. That's cool. Right. But it has nothing to do with allegations because, for real, nobody really knows because nobody was really there other Whoa. than the people that was there. Right. You got. You got, you, got shit. Any money. you got shit. You got shit on the I news. You offering money. Is who offered money? It was Michael Jackson offering these parents money. Uh, he, I believe there was a big payoff to get them to yeah, yeah, stop talking payoff. and basically to drop the. No, trial. I mean for I the no kids to stay there. Was he like paying for the kids to stay there? Um, yeah, there was definitely. So here's from from the some of the one of the cases. I'll just go off one of them that I was reading about. There was definite exchange of uh, something, and it was more of like favors. It's right? bullshit, though. Well, just because you say it's bullshit doesn't mean it's bullshit. So there were there was an exchange of favors, and so there were there was there was money involved, but it wasn't like hey I'll give you twenty grand to have your kids stay at my place. It was right. like hey I get you this job, and so there is there is movement of uh, money, and there is movement of authority and movement of power. Um, but there, it's not like. And then after the fact, though, then there's movement of money to get them to drop everything. But see, right. that's what I was. What I mean about bullshit is there. Okay. If this is the case, you exploiting your kids for money. Right. All right? It and, maybe, and, maybe. And, 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 and you know or, or, or fame or whatever, and you have these allegations, and you still go exploit your kids? All right, so on, let's man. backtrack real quick, all right? Because I don't think, like, that is a possibility. I'm not saying that didn't, that it's not a possibility. But check this. Think about what you were saying earlier, and it's something really important that I want you to think about, Right is you said if we had this kind of a relationship and you mentioned how if your kids were staying there and my kids were staying, right? You said if you had that kind of a relationship where the kids were staying over. So like that is kind of what the point is, is that this guy, he set up this thing. He set up a system like rides. He set up jobs for parents. He set up potential influence for the parents, right? So he befriended them, right? And they definitely had a relationship, right? Okay, right. And then over the course of time, as they build up trust, because this is what a pedophile does, does, right, so you know, I did a lot of security back in the day security, bodyguard, bouncing work. Um, I've done work for tons of celebrities doing that stuff, but uh, also I have studied in depth into this kind of stuff, which is why I think it's so important to talk about because. And it's not even like it's not even about winning this because I don't like I know there's no I don't feel like we have a we have like a feud we're just talking oh, no, right no, now. No, 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 no. But no, more no. so I want to talk about it, and there's one of the reasons I want to talk about it because it's gonna like this the the mentality here is gonna affect other people that are watching this, and if it can even affect like one person for the better, this is why I want to talk about right, it. Right, right, right. So um, think keep in mind like what happens is for somebody that's like a pedophile that's going after like trying to pursue kids, they don't know in their own head they're not like oh I'm gonna bang this kid right. They convince themselves slowly over time, so they do it by proximity first. Mm -hmm. So via proximity, they they get around a kid and around their parents, and they befriend the parents, and they build trust, and they build that relationship where they're, hey, my kid can come over. Hey, your kid can come over here. Hey, we'll stay at your place. Hey, we'll all stay at the same hotel. They build that relationship up over time. Then what happens is this. They attempt to isolate themselves and the kid, mm -hmm. right? So this can be done by taking them back into a bedroom. This can be done by taking them off to the themselves and they don't even realize necessarily that they're doing it and they continue to get in more and more precarious positions with the kid until they're all the way to the point where they're actually fucking a kid. So it's not something that like that um you know by him asking his parents to hang out he's like ah, I'm going to bang a kid, right? Right. But it is something that he's doing subconsciously, kind of like you were saying. It is a subconscious act that they begin to play out in their heads, and they do it again and again and again until they get a winner, right? And it comes from exactly what you said, where it's like they build up a relationship over time where they're going back and forth. But anyways, like, you know, 
I, I just wanted to talk about that real quick because it's it is a hot topic yeah. and it is something that I feel like is important and it's important for um you know for for the general public. Well, well, I, I'll say this: er, er, <laughs> you you know people, right? When you're dealing with people, to an extent, yeah. Yeah, hey, yeah, but okay, I know. Yeah, maybe I don't, you know, but you don't look like a pedophile. Thank you. You don't look like a pedophile. I appreciate it. Thank you. You don't look like a pedophile. Okay? All right? All right? Okay, you say Michael Jackson, he, he don't look like a motherfucking pedophile. <laughs> yeah, he kind of does. He does. <laughs> so, okay. Right? So, my point is, why trust a person like that? If this is what it is, what's more important? Your kid or your all this money and fame. Agreed. If this is if this is what it is. Right. Right. And yeah, and you it's definitely what I'm something that looks sketch. But and also yeah, sketch. with that being said though, there is no look for a pedophile, right? There's no like it's not a set well he looks like he's got beady eyes and he's got, you know, like eyebrows that tilt in. There's no set look. And Michael Jackson's an extreme case because you've got somebody, you know, Michael Jackson, you got R Kelly. These are guys that are famous people and it's not necessarily that they're the stereotype typical rapist and pedophile but if you look at a lot of their behaviors they're performers and because they're performers they're flamboyant so it's like they have flamboyant behavior they have um you know they got crazy costumes and crazy outfits and that's yeah that's what they do you get shit you got you got hefner you got that um um what's his name what's winston whatever fuck that guy name whatever he is got all these motherfuckers but these guys ain't being exploited right that's what's fucked up they not being exploited. Oh, it's out there. Yeah. And then it's swept up under the rug. Yeah. Even, even Elvis, and that's everybody fucking. Agreed. He had 14 and 13 year old. Oh, yeah. You know what I'm saying? And yeah. he's not. And the, he's not getting he's hammered. He's still the king, you know? Agreed. It, it's fucked up. That's, so I agree. It's just one of them things where, why these guys? And I also think, though, I think with Elvis, and there was another musician from the 60s. He's, uh, what's his name? Jerry Lewis. Yeah. Right? Jerry Lewis. Yeah. Jerry, Jerry Lewis. Um, also a guy who married a girl who I think it was like 15 or 16, 14, 15, 16. 14 years old. Underage. Yeah, 14 years old. So there is, you know, I think the difference, and I'm not saying this is better at all, but I'm, I think the difference is I feel like in one case you've got like serial guy, like a guy who in everyone's mind, and both R. Kelly and Michael Jackson, right? Let's pretend for a moment that 100% everything they did, there are, all the allegations are okay. true. all right. So you've got these guys that... Um, they have multiple allegations to where to the point where it's almost like they are serial pedophiles, serial rapists, right? Serial sex offenders. Okay. Versus you got a guy who's definitely having an underage relationship, but it is an exclusive relationship. Not saying that's okay. That makes it any better. But I am saying I do believe that is why in public opinion, that's why they don't. Well, how do we know that crucified. that's the only person they Oh, have. you don't. You exactly. don't know. You that's don't. my point. <laughs> but all I'm saying <laughs> is this. Point. The allegations are for both of them is that they had one relationship, right? But that's allegations. Agreed allegations. But that's not allegations. That's a real thing. I think, it's also, I think it's also important to note that in America, this might be a surprise, but race is also a thing. So like, Hell yeah, race so is a thing. About, if we're talking about, if we're talking but about, but I don't think Michael white. Jackson counts in race, any kind of race. Uh, well, he, can, he counts because he went from black to white, back think, to black. I don't think he counts. He was trying to be. But I also think it's important to note that, like, yeah, I mean, it's it's. Super scummy what they're accused of doing. I don't right, want to make right. it seem like, oh, they're innocent or anything like that. But right. like, especially R. Kelly. But I think it's important to note these are two black guys in America. And yeah. I think that they are held to a different standard than, yes. than, than, than like Elvis or even Woody Allen, right? Yes. People, people or, or Roman I don't, Polanski. I'm not buying it. I don't, no, Roman I don't think so. I, don't I think, it's think a if it was Switch, I think if Elvis. I think it's the numbers. I think if Elvis was accused of doing this with like Multiple, in right. girls. And yeah, then R. Kelly just thing. and R. Kelly just married a fourteen year old. Oh, I, I think, think, okay, okay, I think okay, people also. would still what be about, tripping what about on Elvis. Hefner, though? No, he's he's a player. Yeah, yeah but they were not underage. They weren't underage. They weren't underage. Yeah, yeah, he has some sixteen or fourteen year 
14? They're all 18. Yeah. 18, 20, 21. Oh, no. man. Come on, man. I don't think oh. ever. So I'm I'm saying now, saying. Like now, I would believe that they'd have to be 18 and up. I would say now. Now? But, but back, bet, back in the day, and I don't know, maybe there's allegations I need to hear about, but I've he, never heard he's of not getting hammered. No one's, I don't hear anybody like burning their Playboys. Fuck no. They not because it. <laughs> I don't think it's because he's white, though. <laughs> well, well they, might be, mean, they might be recycling. We're also talking. It's, it's all we're also, ta- we're we're also talking old one. times versus yeah, new it's times. All online, we're comparing. All online. Nah, fuck that. We are. Bill Cosby ass is locked up. That's, That's old time. That's <laughs> serial. That's That's serial. Serial. <laughs> but we're talking about Elvis marrying a fourteen year. I can't even believe he got away with that. Oh yeah. Because well, well, today right. that would have happened. White or not, popular or not, yeah, it's old with. people yeah. would have been freaking yeah, it's out. Old right. with. Yeah. So that my point, my point was not to say that like that is the only reason. Like, right. but I'm saying like it has an there's, effect. There's, there's, there's some validity. There is some validity to it. Sure. Absolutely, I what you're saying that. the numbers thing, but I do think it's Where also people important that are to know. that have some hidden racism are more likely to attack them, and because it, exactly, of, I, and yeah, I, I, I think that's that. important. And, 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 and that's all I'm saying. And you know, I'm not saying Mike did or didn't do it. I just personally, my opinion on him. Okay, I'm saying as far as R. Kelly that. That's he's sick. You know what I'm saying? And, and, yeah. and I'm not even saying I don't know what he did and what he didn't do, but I know that he's getting fried. He had he's getting mm-hmm. family. Yeah. He was he was right. he's playing playing you know, the mercy card. Yeah, he's not now nah, he, nah, he out of there. But you know he has some issues growing up and all that shit. Yeah, too. yeah. But, but everybody does. You know what I'm saying? Well, and and I just I just feel like everybody need to get treated on the same accord. Yeah. Agreed. It don't, it don't need to be. that go through that at a young age are more likely to yes. perpetuate that behavior at a later age. And check this. This is something that you, you know, there's something to think about, right? For a, for a, uh, a person that is a pedophile, the, at the most successful clinic in the United States of America, the most successful clinic, there is still a 50% relapse rate. So at the most successful clinic, that means that one out of two guys, they recommit the same crime, right. having sex with a kid, right? And so the, the, the only, the only um, successful treatment, and that's <clears throat> still with a 50%, 50% relapse rate, the only successful treatment is actually empathy training, where they go through in depth and in detail how the person that they abused, uh, how they felt, and they walk them through the process of building the ability to emote and to understand their emotions. And that has been the most successful treatment. So there's got to be something there, you know. And it's I'm sure it's the same thing with R. Kelly. Is that you've got he has no like he has no idea like for him he has no empathy for the people that are his, that are his victims, you know. Right. So he's able to do it again and again and. Not not feel bad about it because he doesn't need to think about that the same way the same way and i thought about this the other day i was i was listening to um they were they were interviewing some serial killer i don't remember who it was it doesn't really matter but they were interviewing the serial killer and they said they said how is it that you're able to just kill somebody right and he was like uh he's like well i just shut it i shut off my emotions they're like well what about don't you think about the person's feelings he's like no because then i wouldn't be able to kill him <laughs> yeah right yeah right. but then and I, I at the moment i laughed same thing right i was i thought it was really funny and then i was like man like that's the same thing i do when i fight like i well, just I shut was gonna that say, off it sounds like well it sounds like he's like a surgeon or something like that he's like well i guess you got to leave your emotions at home. Yeah. You know what I mean? Right. Like, I think about it when I get home. But at work, you know well, what I mean? I've dated a lot of girls like that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I watched yeah. I watched that Ted Bundy joint, right? Yeah. And from, from beginning to end. and oh, was, I watched that too. It was, it was interesting because a lot of it comes from being bullied and, and stuff like that. That's and, so crazy. And, and the way, you know, um, you were, you were, grew up, you know? Yeah. And it, it, it does something to your it, chemical imbalance in your oh, yeah. brain. And but here's the thing, though, man, because you said you were bullied, right? Yeah, but and I, I was bullied. But, but, but the difference is, like, for me, the difference is... Um, but I'm a crazy cage fighter. Yeah, but so you weren't. I just... I, but I got bullied. So right. my, my, I put my energy in into fucking direction. people up in, in the cage. Right. But in a positive direction. In a positive way. Because you're building skills. It wasn't like you're like, oh, man, I got bullied. I'm going to fuck somebody no, no, else. No, no, no. It was just like you built skill, built but skill, built skill. It still was a chemical imbalance sure, that sure. I had to find balance. I and know. the martial arts yeah. was my balance. Yeah. 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 Mine you manifested know. through anxiety. I did, you have, like, did you get bullied? Yeah, a little bit. Like, or I went to a little. very small school, so it was, like, one of those weird things where, like, the people who bullied me were actually, like, a lot of times my friends. Right. I was, like, oh, just yeah. kind of, oh, like, I like, beaver. I was, like I was, beaver. I was the low end of the totem pole. Yeah. So like, and I had no escape. But right. I like, I was part of this, like, weird, it's not like I could be, like, well, screw you guys, I'm moving on. Because they're your only friends. So these, are my, these were my only options for But peers. also they're assholes. 
Yeah, right. so also these asshole people were also like, hey, you want to come over Friday? You know yeah. what I mean? Like, But they would like fucking wrestle me down to the ground, and I'm like, I, I'm defenseless. I'm not a good wrestler. I'm not a good fighter. So it, Did you feel like they were doing it to be mean, or? They didn't think about it. That's They're the just wrestling like, around. I'm a teacher now. Right. I teach a lot of the same age groups that I got bullied. Yeah. And I look at these kids, and I'm like, they, the way some of the same, like, quote-unquote bullies, the way they talk to me as their teacher, they're nice and respectful. They don't think that they're being bullies. Right. They think that they're just living their lives. And they, don't, they have no idea that they are social animals and the people that they are dominating. To them, it seems like, oh, I'm just being awesome. Yeah. Right. I'm just being yeah. awesome. Yeah. I'm so confident in myself. They have no idea the effect that they're having on young kids. Yeah. yeah. They have no idea the effect that they're having on their peers, even these small micro ways. Right. Yeah. And so at least at bigger schools, it's like, well, these guys, I don't get along with these guys. I'm going to move on to this peer group. Right. Sure. Right. In right. my right. school... Mm -mm. So, what I what it did to me is it forced me to like. I internalized it. Oh, this is who you are. Right. I had right. a very fixed mindset about who I was. So I was like, well, the only way that I can get like people to like me is to either be funny, or to be kind. Right. 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 And so it forced me to think of like, I felt at least at an early age, uh, that I had to earn people's love and I had to earn it. Like, so how'd you do that? By being funny and Just by, by being comedy. smite. By being smart, uh, funny, and being, like, super nice. Yeah. Like, I was like, no one is going to feel the way I feel about myself as a result of talking. Mm -hmm. They're going to feel good about themselves after talking to me because I hate myself. Yeah. And I'm going to be funny because, at the very least, anyone can say anything nice to you and not mean it. Right. Anyone can be like, oh, you're so great, and then they hate you. Sure. Hell yeah. But, but, Hell yeah. But to me... You can't fake laughter. You can't fake comedy. So when someone would laugh and you could see it in their eyes, they actually like laughed a real at what laugh. You said, yeah. They can't hide that. That's not fake. Right. So sure. I was like, I'm gonna do everything I can to chase that moment. So the wow. same way that. Uh, and what Darryl, age? What age is this? Twelve, thirteen. Wow. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I had a chest deformity. I had one of those like concave sternums. I had glasses, my hair looked dumb because I had this like calic and I hadn't figured out a way to fix that. Right. So I was just like this skinny, goofy kid, uncomfortable in his body. My older sister was a year ahead of me and she was popular. So I was like, oh, you're Kristen's brother. And I was like, well, I guess that's my identity is I've got to be the, right. the, the, the if, and then I remember one time in class, I got to laugh at something I said and it just, it changed my world. Wow. wow. I was like, this is, this is me now. This so is I'm going to be funny. And that was my life goal. It was, I'm going to be funny, and I'm going to be smart, and I'm going to be kind at all times. Because at the age of 12, that was your goal. Yeah. So not to be like fireman or get like some career job, but you're just like, I'm just going to be really funny all the time. Not just funny all the time. Funny, kind, and smart. If funny, I could, That was my three-part plan. If I could mm -hmm. be funny, kind, and smart, I was going to be... Because it wasn't like... I, I didn't have that same vibe of like, oh, I can just walk in a room and be like, hey, we're all cool. It was, I need this person. I need Jeremy to like me. I need... Daryl to like me. I need Eric to like me. And if they don't like me, then it means I suck. Mm -hmm. Something's mm -hmm. wrong with me. Do you feel that now? Uh, it creeps in every so often. It's a voice in my head. Here's how I think about it. It used to be like, imagine being a public speaker and that is the only person in the audience. Yep. And they are constantly giving you feedback. Right. Now, I feel like I'm a public speaker. It's a voice in the crowd. Right. But I have other voices. I yeah. have a voice that's affirming me. I have a voice that's like kind of more neutral. I have a critic. Yeah. I have a philosopher in my head. I've got the one that's like, oh, interesting, I'm documenting this. So right. I have like, there's more voices in the crowd. There's more people in the audience. That sure. voice is still there. They have season tickets, but like mm -hmm. they're not, that's not the only voice. So like the other voices, there's more positive affirming voices than that voice that's like, ooh. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, it's crazy because yeah. it, it the, the martial arts is what helped me, yeah. you know, um, through the meditation sure. and, and just the, the, the just the whole philosophy yeah. behind the martial arts. It changed my life. It uh, helped me with confidence and being around people. And, sure. You know, stuff like that. And, yeah. and it helped me have a center, right. you know, and, and understanding pain. You know, pain is a huge part of our life, man. Physical, emotional, you know, psychological, everything, like... If something happens to you as a kid or even as an adult, it's trauma to the brain. You know what right. I'm saying? It's trauma to you, and, and it sticks yeah. with you. Sure. And you have to know how to deal with it and Agreed. face it head on. 
And that's what the martial arts did for me. So I'm same way as you. It's just the martial arts. Yeah, exactly. You know, and exactly. and, and and more as old, the older I get, you know, right. I learned the meditation. You know, really does work and it changed your vibration. You no, know, my vibration is high now because I I get it. You know, and right. And I learned that it's all started from the martial arts, right. understanding vibration and 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 how how you attract laws of attraction and stuff. Man, that stuff is real. And that's where I'm at. And I walk around with all the confidence in the world, not because I can kick your ass, but I can kick your ass, but yeah, not right. because I can you kick can, your ass. Yeah, you can it's because, ass, hey, I know I'm a good guy, you know, and if you don't like me, okay, so what? You missing out. Right. So, yeah. And that's how I feel about it. And, yeah. I move and on if you don't like life. me, I'm going to kick your ass. Not right? Kick your ass. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. So for you guys that uh, don't know Daryl here, he is, in my opinion, a... Devastating Daryl. Devastating Daryl. Sorry. Darryl. I forgot his, his double first name. <laughs> uh, he, in my opinion, you're like a legit martial artist, right? And yes, when I say that, what I mean is um, like the philosophy is not just something you read or you learn to box or learn to kickbox real well or learn to wrestle or learn to put it all together. Like you live the philosophy as well as study it and practice it. It's a real thing for you. Yes, sir. You know, and so when I first met you, I actually, I was like, I was like, who the fuck is this guy? And uh, it was out, oh, I was bouncing. I was bouncing. Yeah. So I used to bounce at a lot of different clubs and a lot of really rough clubs. And so there was this group of people that I was I bounced and it was almost like the identical group is a bunch of guys in like gangs and stuff and they'd go from bar to bar and I would end up following them somewhat around different bars bouncing and cooling down these bars so I'm at a I think at that point in time it was a Mexican restaurant it was a Mexican Fairy restaurant yeah Laredo's and I, I think it was a huge scrap that just happened and I was tossing people around and then uh, you came up to me and you knew I knew Jermaine and you were like, hey man, anybody who's a friend of Jermaine's is a friend of mine, I got your back. Yeah. <laughs> and my first thought was get the hell away from me. I don't know you and I definitely don't want your help. Yeah. Right? And then that, but I met you and then I think I saw you. Then it was crazy. I saw you like a week later at church. Um, <laughs> yeah. And I didn't even go to church. So it was like, that was kind of weird. That was like, you know, yeah, what like church? Gangsta nightclub to, to uh, church. church. <laughs> yeah. Hey, man, he's life. got your back in the right, Lord, right. too. Yeah. <laughs> he's got your back so in the gospel. At, yeah, Grace Church at Grace Church, Hal Santos's church. And my uh, brother in law, he was a youth pastor at the time. And then um, I don't think he was my brother in law at the time. But no, he definitely wasn't. But it was, there were a bunch of people that I knew there, so I would help out behind the scenes over there. And then uh, that I ran into you randomly, probably right now, skirting out for an event or something. Yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, that's how we met. I didn't like you the first day, night I met you. And then after I saw you at church, I was like, what the hell? And then I, you this know. This guy's got a whole other side. It's not just some asshole. Yeah. But you weren't even an asshole that night. You were being really nice and you were being genuine. But it's like, you know how it is when people come up to you um, that you don't know and you don't know if they're being nice. You don't know if they're being genuine. You, you know, because sometimes people just say, oh, hey, man, I got your back because they want your back. They want you to have their back. Right, right, right. right. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's that's cool. And, and, and it ended up he helped me get ready for one of my Bellator fights. Oh, oh. you know, he was there. He, he came and spoiled he your back. Me, and he actually had my back. And Family's that's, good that's for true. That. Well, he, he helped me with one of my Bellator fights. You know, what's funny is, man, in the fight game. You meet a lot of people in the fight game that they don't understand the relationship side of the fight game. And so they will show up at fights, right? And this is a crazy thing. Like, this doesn't make sense to me. You show up at weigh-ins. You show up at the fight, right? It's a Thursday, Friday night. Right. Um, you've got everybody there is a fighter, right? Everyone knows everyone there is a fighter. Okay? It's gold. Um, but you get people that still feel the need to personify that fighter personality, that they're, they're super tough, yeah. right? Like, we're all there to beat the shit out of each other. But, yeah. like, you feel like that's not enough on the toughness level, so you need to, like, churn it up, right? <laughs> like, you're literally there to punch people in the face, get punched in the face. You don't think that's tough enough, so you have to bring an extra personality. So you get these guys that walk around, they're like assholes, and all they really end up doing is they end up shutting themselves down. They end up missing out on a lot of opportunities. Yeah. And versus the guys that are friendly and they just say what's up, like you and, like, uh, you know, a handful of other MMA guys right, right. that are smarter and they understand the game better and they will meet people from different schools they'll meet people to train with they'll meet people that are all over the place that help with marketing and help with all types of different yeah. things and it just comes down to being friendly and being personable and uh, being a genuine person you know a lot of improv stuff I feel like a lot of improv stuff so Nathan here has trained at the IO in Chicago yeah I we're talking to like 
someone who's been like on reality TV shows and a guy who went viral and it's like, hey, I'm a teacher and I do That's, comedy sometimes. So, yeah, like, it doesn't sound... For most people, it probably isn't that great of a, of a thing to say because nobody knows... Not a lot of people know what the I.O. is. Unless you're in the improv thing. I don't think most yeah. people know. Do you know what I, I.O. is? No. No. Prob- no. Okay. Yeah. So the I.O. is in Chicago. It's the Improv Olympics. It is... Um, there's two big organizations in Chicago. There's the I.O., which is Improv Olympics, and then the other one is the Second City. Okay? And then there's kind of the, like... Ralph Nader of the third. It's Are we going to get an example? Is, it's the annoyance. Are we going to get an example? Yeah, we need an example. I-O. Of like the improv. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh. Yeah. So what he what he's done is with the I.O., it's a it's a more of an elite group where they have a higher standard, I think, to get in. And then the other one, the other group, which is the second city, which is more of a general um, uh, kind of, I think anybody can get in. They're more well, accepting. So, uh, well, anyone can take classes anyway. Like, right. So the, I, I, to be fair, like okay. it's not like I like auditioned and got into I.O. I just, you just went train there. I just yeah, I just studied there. You know what I mean? I just paid my money and I took the That's classes it. and I had my graduation show and I okay. watched all these great performers and I got to talk to these amazing people. You know so what I mean? I, so like, I, it was a learning experience. It was great. Am I misunderstanding but, that it's not an elite group? Mm, so okay, here's the thing. Like, just like with like any training center, force recon. Anyone can improv. take the class. Right. Okay, so right. anyone, if you pay the money, you can take the class. Okay. If you then graduate and audition, then you're elite. Like if you make a show, oh, okay. you're so you got to make it. Yeah. So like I you got to make it. So I like see. I was only up there for a summer. Right. Like I took the, I went through their curriculum over the course of a summer, knowing that I was not going to live in Chicago. Deal. Sure. Yeah, like I still studied at I.O. That like awesome. I can always say that. And I can always say that like. I got notes from Sharna Halpern, who's like sure. the godmother of long form improv. Yeah. Uh, she and I like talked and she gave me notes and I held her dog. You know what I mean? Like we talked education and stuff like that. Sure. Um, so like I can always say that. And I'll always. Now, what is, well, now, can you kind of explain to me? Because I don't, I don't know exactly what it yeah, is. Yeah, for sure. Like improv in general or like. Yes, I improv in general. So it, that and yeah. I.O. Right. So like if we're talking about improv and here we are at the improv shop in St. Louis. Um, improv is the art of making up theater on the spot. OK. So we have. And I'm putting this in quotes rules. To doing that. There's just more like guidelines that make it better. OK. Yeah. So the classic line is yes. And right. So that's the, the classic philosophy for improv. OK. Um, and for an, for an example. Um, what that basically means is you don't. So if I make a statement, right? Yeah. Uh, you don't try and block the statement or go against the statement. Yeah. You always add on to it. Yeah. So uh, if I was like, let's say we're creating a story and we're doing like an act or a scene, um, I'd be like, man, this morning I was on a yellow bus. Right. So I know this information now about him. So he says, man, this morning I was on a yellow bus. Okay. Right. So the fact that he's telling me that, I I have to infer a lot. So if he says, man, this morning I'm on a yellow bus and I have to make the decision for myself, why is he telling me this? But how can I accept that and add on to it? Okay. Right? And so I'd, maybe I would assume, like he said, this morning I was on a yellow bus. The first thing that makes me think of is a school bus. So right. I'd be like, yeah, buddy, and it was your first big day. Right. And that's why I packed you that lunch. You know what I mean? So, like, I assume now that I'm his, he's my kid. I see. And yeah, you're I was on the big scene. yellow bus, you know what I mean? So, I see. like, and I now see. I'm like, yeah, buddy. And Miss Carruthers says you had a great first day. You know what I mean? So, like, I see. Now we're building on that. So, we're building on the details. So, yes, he was on a yellow bus. All right, so let's give it a shot. On to that. Ready? All right. Yeah. All Are right. we starting with the yellow bus? Let's do it. All right, so we start no, with yellow start bus. with something else. Somebody already, else. All right, you already, start something. Um, then we'll just go around the table. So you're going to start something, you're going to start a story, and then we're going to build through that story real quick. None of it. Man, there's so many people here. It's a hell of a comedy show. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's good. So like, you, so you yes the fact that there are a lot of people here, and then you add it on. You add it on a detail of, yeah, it's a hell of a comedy show. All right, here we go. One Parker's more time. Job. Okay, let's do it. Man, there is a lot of people here. Oh, yeah, man. It's some hell of a comedians here. Yeah, that weird thing is that they're all comedians. Nobody's actually in the crowd. These open mic nights are just getting terrible. 
I guess nobody's going to clap for us if nobody's here watching. Maybe because the drinks suck in this motherfucker. <laughs> so, we got a scene, and you yeah, basically right, we right. built around, yeah. and we kept adding stuff on, right? And it's it's at first you got funny yeah, yeah you got a you've got a basic scene you got a you got a lot of people here right and then you you built on that it's a comedy show in the first one but then the second one you said a lot of comedians right so right. that changed what I was gonna say so then the set when you said a lot of comedians then I switched it off to like uh, oh there's nobody in the crowd now you got a weirder situation where yeah. all the comedians are pretty much up on stage right and nobody's watching then you got to yeah then I I basically thought like. All right, it's a bunch of basically just like masturbatory uh, open mic night comics that are like, well, I'm here to do my set. You know right. what I mean? Like rather than like actually being supportive. So I got this idea that made me think of there's nobody in the audience, but it's like, I mean, there's four of us here, but maybe there's like 10 to 20 just terrible local comics right. who are just there for an sure. open mic night. No audience. It's just them waiting in the green room being like, all right, tonight's a night. And that got me to thinking after everybody says their funny thing. There's going to be no applause. Yeah. And, and, and I just thought maybe because they're not drunk enough. Yeah, right. <laughs> and this motherfucker. So yeah. you got one rule, which is yes, Sam, which is always work together, like always add on to whatever somebody says. So what's another one? Um, don't, ask, don't ask too many questions. Don't assume, ask too many questions. Assume information. Oh, wow. Okay. So rather than being like, hey, how was your day? I don't know. How do you think my day was? How about you tell me, right? The audience, hey, it's uh, the audience is gonna get like, all right, come on, what happened? But also like the even the performers, it's kind of like you're making your scene partner do all the work. Ah, uh, yeah. So what you should do instead of being like, hey, how was your day today? Be like, your teacher, not to keep making teacher bits, but like, <laughs> you had a terrible day. Like, assume the information. So if I tell Daryl. You had a terrible day today. Now I'm giving him information. Right. Right. I'm giving, it's called a gift. So I'm giving you the gift of you had a bad day. And now he immediately has something to like assume something about his persona. So now to yes and that, he's not going to be like, no, I didn't. It was a great day. Because nah, now, off now, we're, now, now we're arguing day. over reality. Rather just, just assume yeah, it was a bad day. I uh, yeah. I got fired because oh, I oh I'm constipated. Yeah, I was constipated <laughs> and I uh, shoved my boss into a locker so that I could so I could get to the bathroom first, right? Like whatever it was. That's pretty fucking funny, man. Right. So you just build and you just like assume, and then I'll be like, we had a mortgage payment. Why the fuck would you do that? Like yeah. whatever it is, you know what I mean. And so like the cool thing in improv too is That's like dope. you play, you're not yourself. Right. right, so you can play a different gender, you can play a different whatever you need to. Like, obviously, like be mindful. Don't be. That's a problem. Is sometimes people go in like trying to do something and they're making it off the, off the top of their heads. So you want to be spontaneous, but sometimes people say shit that's like a little thoughtless, or they, uh, uh, you know, maybe a little cartoonish or stereotypical. And they, you can tell a lot of times they're honestly trying not to. It's just like whatever comes up. So right. You want to be like mindful of like, all right, if I'm gonna play a woman on stage, I'm not just gonna be like, eh, well, I'm here washing the dishes. You know what right. I mean? Like, you're not gonna just try to play this like trope of like, but you want to be mindful. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. You want to be that mindful of who you're playing, and you want to play them with a little bit of justice. And and you teach here at the improv. I don't. I coach. I don't coach. teach. Not, I don't oh, teach sorry. classes. Do not coach. teach. I they teach high school coach. improv, but I don't. That's I, that's cool. I'm man. a high school teacher. I do teach. Okay. Improv, but I don't teach at the shop. I do Got coach it. though, coach. and I perform uh, on a house team here, and then a couple of independent teams. And then, do you do stand up as well? I have tried stand up. Um, I didn't like it. Why not? It's very vulnerable, and you have oh, to be yeah. yourself. Yeah. So I was a really good joke writer, right? Uh, but I did not like the idea that like. So when I said something, it was on me, and I had to own it. And basically, right. if the audience doesn't like it, they don't like you. And they don't like the fact that you've, what you've prepared. Whereas, like, an improv, it's like, oh, I had a bad set. Well, I was playing a character, and I was making it off, off the top of my head, and there's going to be another show, and it was not oh, an indication of me. Yeah. 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 It was just what I had to be thrown into. Whereas in stand-up, it's like, that I've been true. working on this material for months, and you oh, yeah. hated it. And that feels very vulnerable. Oh, yeah. yeah. So I've done sketch. I've done stand-up. I've done improv. I'm pretty good at sketch and 
improv. Stand up, if I would have kept going, I think I could have been pretty good. Because I think I'm a good joke writer. I think I'm a decent public speaker. I think I can read an audience pretty well, but I uh, I just didn't get the same joy, ultimately. Do you still write now? I haven't in a while. I, I'm, I can come up with ideas for a sketch or something like that, sure. and I'll tell other people, and I'll be like, I'm not going to do anything with it. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, uh, yeah. But That's I, what I'm, I'm working a good, on. I could be a... I was a good writer when I was doing it. Sure. I was a producer for a sketch show called Sketchpad for two years. Oh, wow. Sketchpad, is that... I, I've heard of that, man. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we did stuff for, like... We had a show for St. Louis Public Radio. We played at the Marcel for a while in uh, Grand Center Arts. We went to the show on Comedy Festival in Columbia. Um, I mean, we did some cool stuff, but I just... Uh, I'm, you know, I'm not with him anymore, but it was a really fun, formative experience. Sure. Oh, cool. Really liked it. Dope. Got to play some fun characters, original characters, and uh, it was a great opportunity. That's awesome. Great opportunity. It is. It there you go. Well, we are about one hour in, and I think that's going to be it for today. What um, are you going to call this episode? What's that? What a wider range of uh, oh, we're gonna topics. Call it. It's definitely putting the Michael Jackson in there, so I don't know. Okay. Um, we're probably just going to... I'm going to go the over Jackson every... Jackson 4. <laughs> I think you should call it the, the drink sucking this motherfucker. Because <laughs> that was hilarious. I love that part. That was awesome. That was awesome. Oh, <laughs> that is our show. Dude. That was good. That was good. Thanks for watching us. I hope right. you guys have a good night. Peace out, everybody. Right on. Make sure to hit that subscribe button, and we'll see you soon. Follow us on Instagram. Uh, make sure to follow Eric Catalano. What's your, your favorite um, social media platform? Um, Instagram, a.k.a. Busy. And then follow AKA me on busy. Instagram. Yeah. Okay. And follow me on Instagram, too. Follow us on Instagram. I got Instagram. You can Devastate follow me if you want. DC. Follow us on Instagram. I hope you guys have an awesome night. We will see you soon. Later, guys.